Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And some folks have been asking about me doing a really just a full length start to finish video on making an arrowhead for one of my primitive hunting arrows, but doing it with all Aboriginal tools. And so if you are looking for a really short video and you're gonna get aggravated if you have to sit through 40 minutes of content, this is not your video. This is for people that really want to sit down and learn how to flint nap their own arrowheads, especially with abo tools or antler and or stone tools. So that being said, I'm working with heat treated Edwards chart from Texas. And the reason we're doing this is because we're making an Edwards style point and I'll kind of explain what later while why we are making that, that type of point. But you may have come here from the video on making the Stone Age arrow. And if you didn't come here from watching that video, I'm gonna drop a link down in the description and go check that out. And that's where we take a little piece of hardwood, we straighten it out and we make a, another very long in-depth video start to finish on how to make an arrow with nothing but Stone Age technology and Stone Age materials. So this is gonna be the point that we are going to use on that arrow. So follow along as we do this. Now, this is, like I said, heat treated Edwards chert, and I do wanna make mention before we get started that all these videos, everything that I do is completely sponsored by my own website, which is huntprimitive.com. And that's where we sell bows, arrows, atlatl, stone points, flint knives, anything that you could need for primitive hunting is available at huntprimitive.com. So do please go check that out. And there you will also find napping kits for starters, as well as the same exact rock that I'm working with right now. So head on over there, check this stuff out. Basically anything you need is there. And there's lots of tutorial stuff here on my YouTube channel. So anyway, uh, heat treated Edwards chert. I guess one more note, somewhere to send to Some people may want to know what heat treating is. Heat treating is when you uh, fire rocks or you cook rocks to make them break cleaner or sharper. Okay, I have a whole other video on that. In fact, it's one I did years and years ago. Quite honestly, it's a horribly self-narrated video, but it's really instructional. I'll drop that down in the link as well in case you want to watch that. So basically everything that you could need to know about this stuff, I'm dropping a link to somewhere. So we're going to move the camera close. You're not going to hear or you're not going to be able to see my face as much. We're just going to focus on the work and I'm going to talk you through what I'm doing. And we're going to go start to finish without skipping a beat on this. So let's, uh, well, let's just get on to making the point. All right, so the tools and material here we're using, we'll probably bounce around to a couple different pieces of chirp for the most part and, uh, until I find one that I really like to working with me, but uh, pretty much just any any flake or spall of this Georgetown or Edwards or Paternalis kind of rock. I don't, that wasn't a tool, that was just a stick. <laughs> but anyway, here's some of the tools I'm working with. I got an antler flaker right here, and this is, um, you know, just a deer antler tine. Kind of the funny thing about this is you can make, I'm missing one here somewhere. Yeah, hold on one second. Let me sort that, there it is. All right, now <clears throat> I wanna kinda of show you how you can take an antler and turn that into uh, a whole set of points. So this would be say like the long tine, right? And then we'll take another short tine, say something like this and that'll stick in front and then the main beam runs out to here. So, if, so imagine that deer antler and then if you follow the, the base of that antler down around, you can get your little billet. So this is just a small little billet. So essentially come up from the, from the head, you have the pedicle, which will be the, uh, our little billet. And then this would be the first time the second tine, and then the main beam. Okay, so you can take a whole little four-point antler and turn it into all the little tools you need. And so we're gonna use this for little percussion napping, and you've probably seen me before where I do a lot of lap napping with a bigger billet. And we don't necessarily have to. I'm gonna show you how to work with these very small 
white-tailed deer antler billets because there's some misconceptions that white-tailed deer antler doesn't work as well is we like to think it does and it's basically it's because we're, we're trying to use longer pieces of antler and we're trying to swing them at larger at longer distances and that's not how this stuff works really well I like these little nubbin type of billets that we can swing freehand as opposed to lap napping and I do a lot of the lap napping but in this one we're not going to do that then of course here's our flaker that we're going to use for major pressure flaking removal uh, maybe potentially a little bit of punch work but probably not the main beam I just ground down and kind of flat and we're going to use that for notching if we need it and in a little time we're going to use uh, for our edge making okay so we're gonna serrate the point and make it very sharp and then if there's any little flakes we need to remove we'll use this one but we don't use this one for general um, pressure flaking because we'll wear that fine little tip down and when you need to sharpen these you just take a rock and you sharpen it down now I do need there it is right there my abrading stone so and that's essentially all it is is it's just a coarse rock that we can a lot of times I work with a bigger one but I kind of wanted to show you this little tiny kit because it's it's so small the whole thing can fit in your fit in your hands like this you can make like a little tiny bag and put them and carry around and that's all you need to make these little arrowheads with and you know you can carry around a little abrasive stone like this and it'll do everything you need to do for abrading your piece of shirt or flint and of course we're not covering the basics of flint napping in this and uh, at some point, whether it's in the description right now or not when you're watching this, at some point there will be a video on the basics of flint napping in which I'll use copper tools and I'm going to show people how to get started with flint napping, but that's not what we're doing right, right now. We're, we're talking about taking primitive tools like even this piece of rock that I can use as an abrader is still a tool for percussion napping. Okay, I'm removing flakes with this tool. And sometimes it works good, sometimes it doesn't. Especially when we decide to switch to the antler tool and say if our antler tool doesn't remove a flake very good, sometimes we can switch back and forth and actually use the piece of rock and it'll knock that flake off perfectly. Okay, so be willing to use your tools in many, many different ways. You don't need a lot of tools. You just need to be versatile in how you use them. So we're going to work for this piece of stone. Like I said, it's not a beginner's tutorial for napping, but it's going to show you how to use antler tools. And a lot of this, while I'm going to explain what I'm doing, a lot of this you're going to have to watch and see what I'm doing and try to draw correlations between your napping and my napping because as much as I can explain what I'm doing sometimes the best thing you can do is grab some tools go out and try it once you've experienced it for yourself come back watch the video and you'll essentially find little tips and tricks along the way that you didn't even really know existed until you watch it and then say I did that that's that works or that didn't work and so we're always going to use I'm going to refer to this a few times so I'm going to give you some very very slight basics and again the reason I don't want to do complete basics of flint napping is I'm going to bore the heck out of everybody uh, that's fairly experienced by stopping to explain every single step about platforms and but some of the the very 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 basics so you at least know what I'm talking about when I'm working with a piece of rock I like to talk to it talk about it in working in layers say if you took pieces of paper and stack them all together this way with the rock as we remove every sheet of paper we're gonna get closer to a, a general center line and so essentially everything that's on the the outer edges are the pieces of paper that are further away so that's just different layers and essentially what we're doing is we are taking the high layers and turning them into the low layers so we're not trying to remove flakes into the places that are already shallow like this we're trying to take away all the high spots again that's kind of the bas basics of napping so I hope I don't have to explain that too awful much but that's how I'm looking at this piece 
as I'm trying to work it into an arrowhead and I have no idea which is the point which is the base I'm assuming this is the point and this will be the base but quite frankly I could break this thing completely off and then turn it around and say well now this is the base and this is the point so I have no idea all I'm doing is trying to thin this piece to make a biface in order to make a tool out of and as I freehand nap with antler good little flake right there you'll see me quite often probably especially as we get closer to the form I'm looking for is I'll start rocking the piece of rock back and forth like this and that's me trying to judge where to hit it next and then of course the abrader is just about knocking all the little pieces off along the way and if you don't know what abrading rock really does again without dipping too deep into the basics of flint napping is we're knocking off all the little edges the little fragile edges because when you hit it and it's like over here I haven't hit I haven't abraded that and you hit it all it does is chatter and knock off these little tiny pieces but if you abrade it first and kind of stiffen the platform you can run longer flakes with it like I just did right there so that's what abrading does now I'm gonna look for the biggest platforms first right here is probably my biggest platform hopefully you can kind of see that and again just kind of work it back and forth until it's comfortable find the right spot and then you can remove that perfect flake so it step fractured a bit here but that's no big deal we're gonna come at it from this angle later on so that's not the end of the world and not every single flake that I remove is about trying to drive one long. Sometimes I'm just trying to work towards shaping it into more of a triangle to turn into a point. So sometimes it's what we call battering is when you're just kind of taking these uncalculated hits because you're raising platforms to one side so you can remove those flakes. And again, that's again the basics of uh, flint napping in general is platforms working it from one side all the way to the other so you can remove a long flake like that one so again we're trying not to cover that stuff too awful much here but it's hard because I always want to teach people I want I want everybody watching this no matter of your skill level to be able to look at this and say now I can go make an arrowhead and I know that this stuff is is a little bit more advanced than the basics of flint napping but most of the people that have been following me for a long amount of time I think already have a grasp on the basics and if you're just finding me now watch some of my other films because you'll learn some stuff along the way uh, even if it's not a direct beginners video you're gonna learn some stuff about uh, little tips and tricks along the way about how to get pieces thin or how to deal with with uh, weird shaped pieces, angles, and geometry, and all that kind of silly stuff. So, again, kind of just working this through. That's a really nice one. We're getting this little funny step fracture. And that happens. It'll happen. Just because you get a step fracture is not the end of the world. Essentially what we'll end up doing is probably coming in from the back side and running that off. And now we got this weird 90 degree angle right here. And uh, we're almost going to do a zigzag pattern on that where I take a hit off this way. Okay. And then we're going to flip it over. And I'm going to take off this way. Nice flake just came off. And we're going to flip it back over. Take another one off this this side maybe maybe it won't let go there we go got it and then this side again so in, instead of working when you have something that's got a big flat edge like this you don't just completely work all the way on one side sometimes you have to work back and forth just like that now I you'll notice that I don't abrade as much when I'm working antler tools, sometimes I do, especially if I collapse an edge, collapse an edge 
that I'm hitting, but oftentimes with antler, antler grabs pretty good, but sometimes I get some of these wonderful flakes without even a braiding. And that's something that's, it's a little bit teachable, I can tell you, that hey, antler sometimes requires less of braiding, but until you put your hands on it and feel the difference between working antler tools and copper tools, you may not uh, really grasp that concept. So if you ever see me work with copper tools, which for years and years I didn't, and here only recently have I started doing that, just essentially so I can instruct better, <laughs> um, the comparisons between copper and antler. Copper tools, I almost abrade every single uh, hit, where antler tools, I can run a whole series of flakes without abrading even once. And this does take quite a bit, especially with these little tiny nubbin uh, billets. It takes a certain amount of hand-to-eye coordination. So your beginner nappers probably don't have the ability to say, here's, here's a tiny, tiny, tiny little platform right here, and I'm going to hit that with a billet. Like that's, that does take a little bit of practice, so don't get discouraged. But my targets that I'm aiming for are typically these tiny little platforms that are just sticking out. Now, whether I uh, abrade them or even, I haven't done any yet, but sometimes I'll take my pressure flaker, like I'll just use one here in this example, and I will develop that platform better. So sometimes if you don't get one that really wants to let go, if you develop the platform with your pressure flaker, then abrade it braided off, and then you can knock a pretty decent flake. Here we go. Right across that way. So again, it's the versatility of tools. Just because you start with percussion doesn't mean the second that you switch to pressure flaking means that now you pressure flake. Sometimes you use the pressure flaker like I'm doing right now. The closer you get to your shape, you'll use more of your pressure flaker. But we'll use the pressure flaker to develop the platforms that you can hit off with your billet. Just like that. Perfect. There's a good one right there. Very good. So again, just gonna develop just another tiny little basic on this is when you Say I have a platform I want to remove a flake from. So like right here, this is a little bit high. I kind of want to work through this. I may not do this percussion, but this is a good example just to talk about. If you kind of follow the the center line of this piece, try and hold it here so you can see it. It kind of jogs off to the side, and then it kind of goes over to this side, and then comes back. And when you want to develop this platform, sometimes the angle is too severe. It actually undercuts and comes back. And if you hit this, all it's gonna do is create a step fracture. So what you actually have to do is pressure freak that off a little bit just to create a sturdier platform that has less of an undercut platform. And I think sometimes it just comes into reading the rock and knowing what to expect. But if you have an undercut platform, the undercut essentially makes like a, a valley in between uh, the edge that you want to hit and the center of the stone. And of course, we've removed that now. But uh, in general, if you hit that, all it's going to do is step fracture in the middle of the point. I kind of did one there almost intentionally, just a little one. And you can see where there was a little bit of a valley in here and I hit it anyway and we got a tiny bit of a step fracture right here. I'm trying to see if uh, you can kind of see that a little bit. So I hit it here and there was a valley in here and you can see how it step fractured and we have a little turtle back right here. We need to remove that. So you can kind of see it here a little bit. So that's what happens when you have a valley. Now, you don't attack it from this side. What we're going to do is we're going to come and actually remove flakes off of this side to raise our platform up to here. And then we'll be able to hit percussion and probably knock this turtle back off a little bit more. So 
Watch as we do that quick. We're just going to use a little bit of pressure. And essentially, I'm not trying to drive flakes all the way across this. I'm trying to build the, the platform up on that side so we can remove a longer flake to thin this piece. See if you can see what I'm talking about here to where we've moved the platform off to this side. Okay, so you can see it comes straight up and then it jogs over. And now when we abrade, I'm going to abrade away from the direction I actually want to hit. I don't know if that's psychological or if that actually makes a difference, but I typically abrade away from it. And then when I hit, I'm going to hit it from this side this way. So that makes me, I have to turn it this way so I can hit down and there you can see we ran some flakes all the way across now oh that was a good one you couldn't see it because the thing went flying a little bit more right sometimes too turn your billet until you find the edge that you're looking for that they meet up because sometimes the edge is too flat it's going to hit too much of the rock find just the perfect geometry in which they're going to strike move this and perfect so we thin that right out and this antler wears down all the time so your edge is going to constantly change that was a pretty good flake so your edges between your billet and your point are constantly changing. So don't be afraid to stop and analyze every single major hit that you make. I mean, not everything, not every single flake is important. I'm not going to lie and just say, well, you have to calculate every single thing that you take off. Some of this, we're just crushing the edge. We're building a platform. We're battering the edge to build a platform. Sometimes we're just powering through some stuff just so we can get a platform that we can actually take a good hit off of. That one. It's a pretty good one there. So you can see we're starting to get more to a shape. Now actually this is quite large. It's a lot larger than I really want for my arrowhead. I just haven't made a, enough mistakes, honestly. Thin it out. You got to be careful when you hit the back of a point. It's a great way to break it right in half. I've done that so many times. That's probably the number one time that you stand a chance of breaking a point is when you hit it from a back from the back. And but that's how you also get some of the best thinning flakes for hafting. So just take some practice. And I still break them all the time doing that. And I know better than to do it, but sometimes you just got to do it. It makes you a better napper. Every time you break a piece, you kind of learn, oh, what can I do and what can I get away with next time around. Good one. Another good one. Overall, looking pretty good. In fact, we're, we're actually getting... We're getting thin enough, we can start finishing this point, but the problem is, is it's such a big point. It would probably make a phenomenal atlatl point, but we're trying to make an arrow point here, which is a lot smaller. So I think we just need to kind of work through it. What I'm gonna do is take the pressure flaker. We have a side of here that looks actually pretty good, but this side's kind of got a lot of crummy stuff. So I'm gonna remove stuff off the bottom, off this side to build a platform so we can actually get rid of some of the crummy stuff. So that's just strategic uh, flake removal at this point. So pressure flake a little bit off the bottom. Uh, swing my leg under so I have a better platform. You see a lot of people will hold a pad and they work with their hand right like this and I just don't nap like that that's not my style I've been kind of self-taught and been doing this for years that's why I consider myself for the most part 
a lap napper because most of the work I do is right in my lap. I use my leg as a brace. It doesn't necessarily matter the technique that you use just so long as it you're comfortable using it. That's a good remove. Good one. At this point we're just still we're just building little platforms and still trying to thin it. So there's a lot of people that would stop right now and say, well, I'm going to finish this out as an arrowhead, but that's not exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a small point uh, that's kind of a, the same style of point that's going to be featured in my video. I'm not even sure when it's going to come out, but we've got a pretty good sized video that's going to be the context of primitive archery in which we really talk about the size of arrow points how they were used in prehistoric times. So make sure you subscribe to my channel just so you can follow that information in the future. Uh, again, I don't know when it's gonna come out, but it's something I'm kinda, kinda working on passively in just collecting data in video to include in that. So it's probably gonna be a pretty good one by the time it's all said and done. So that beautiful flake, beautiful thinning flake we just dropped off right there. really getting into a, a good shape. We're not far off of uh, finishing this off except for the fact that it is so large. Uh, you know this isn't actually much different than the size of the point that I used to take the the bison in the bison documentary. If you haven't seen that make sure you go check my channel out and watch that but I, I assume if you're watching this you've probably seen that that's one of my uh, kind of flagship videos is the hunting the ancient bison with the atlatl working with Texas A&M University and Morgan Smith who if you want a little bit of backstory on him if you've been kind of following along with any of his story at all he's uh, graduated from Texas A&M and he's actually got himself a professor career at University of Tennessee at Chattanooga so he walked right out of Texas A&M and right into a job as an assistant professor which is uh, from what I'm told I'm not in the academic circle so much but from what I hear that's actually uh, quite an accomplishment to walk right out of school and walk right into a, a career as a professor of anthropology and actually believe that or not <clears throat> as I'm sitting here working on this today is uh, today's a Tuesday and believe it or not, a week from today, yeah, Tuesday, and one week from today, I'll actually be in Chattanooga teaching a class on doing the same exact thing. Flint napping, uh, stone projectiles, hafting them to atlatl four shafts and arrow shafts, and uh, talking to students there at UTC about uh, all the same stuff I'm pretty much teaching you on the internet right now. Now essentially what we're doing is we're just refining the edge <clears throat> and we've got a, a, a big shape. Again this is a big point. Essentially the reality is we could take half of this knock it off which I kind of hate to do. Normally, if I make a point that's this big, I'll just turn it into an atlatl point and go with it. But we're do we're we're doing so well on it, <laughs> um, and I hate to just finish it and say, "Oh, cool, it's an atlatl point." I want to show you the actual arrow point, and so I'm going to do something that I pretty much rarely ever do, and I'm going to reduce this size really drastically because I want to make a video or make a point for the video for my Stone Age arrow. It's kind of a poor allocation of of this lithic resource, but like I said, sometimes I think primitive peoples would have taken something like that, 
perhaps made a, a different tool out of it, a, a, maybe even a knife, or if it overlapped in the atlatl times, they would have used it for an atlatl point, sharpened it down, and then made an arrow point uh, later in time with it. But we're working it down right now because we need an arrow point out of this thing. So I'm just going to quickly reduce material off the back which is sketchy dangerous but if you follow me at all you know I just do what I want to do there we go all right so we're gonna keep working towards our overall shape braid and edge Perfect. All right, so now we're down to a more manageable triangle size, and it's actually pretty thin already. We don't need to do a whole lot more to it. I mean, really, if you if you see what we're working with here, it's pretty pretty thin already. But and I really try to secure my leg platform here. And drive a couple good flakes off and so what we're doing now is we're using the the, pr the pressure flaking to get a hold of some of our small platforms that aren't big enough to really hit with percussion and we're just we're I'm rocking back with my thumb this way and same thing here I kind of meet it in a peak and then as I want to break it off I roll them together and push and break away so kind of watch this here a little bit slow see if you can see what's going on so I kind of find the platform I want, push together, roll, until it releases. And that's how I pressure flake on my lap. Or a lot of people would just hold it here and they would just push down. And that's how you're going to get a bunch of short choppy flakes on this side. I'm trying to drive flakes across as far as reasonably possible with pressure flaking with antler. So it is a little bit of a... A technique curve it's not it doesn't come easy to a lot of people to roll things back like this and then together uh, and I'm just self-taught over years and years and years of doing this kind of stuff But you'll find even as I go fast, you'll always see that I resort back to kind of angling them away from each other like this. And then I'll kind of roll together. That's where my power comes from, is the, the compression of these things, these my thumb and the tool coming together. So the callus on my thumb right here is actually quite severe from the rocking back and forth and pushing together. It's uh, might wear you out over time, but <clears throat> if you do it enough like I do, you'll you'll get pretty used to it. So again, I'm not trying to. A lot of times, people take a piece of rock and when they get it to where it almost looks like a triangle, they're just like, "That's good enough. That's an arrowhead," and that's not that's not how I work a piece of rock. I work a piece of rock until I get it as good as I can get it as symmetrical as I can get it and I can make the best point that I can make out of that rock. A lot of people a long time ago, like I said even before I reduced the back end, would have simply just said okay well that's a good arrowhead and I'm going to turn it into that and it would have been, it wouldn't have been as refined. And I'm not afraid to take a piece that's bigger and still looks nice and continue to refine it down, refine it down and lose overall size. The overall size of a point is not terribly important to me. In fact, if you've followed pretty much anything that I've done, we talk about it to great uh, lengths in the bison video, but the real reality is, is big game hunting points are actually quite small compared to what we think of modern day standards, where we think well, a big animal requires a big point to kill it. And what we found really and it's been supported uh, with the universities through the archaeological record with looking at points from like ar archaeologically excavated points from kill sites 
is that some of your biggest animals, like the early megafauna, like mastodons and mammoths, were killed with very, very small points thrown off at laterals. And we can see that in the record as well, that when, they, when the bow and arrow came around, the points got smaller and smaller and smaller. And they were killing, you know, like a point like this was a big arrow point. They were killing bison and still other pretty big animals, elk, with these tiny little triangles, just the size of that right there, let alone this whole piece. And this would have still been the size of most of your atlatl points. And I'm not saying that no big arrow points existed, but the the vast majority of your of your arrow points were quite small little little uh, pieces, and they they kill game exceptionally well. And I've shown that in a lot of my my videos as well. But anyway, hopefully you're watching the progression of this and just seeing that we're getting smaller and smaller all the time, and I'm ref refining it. And essentially, what I'm doing is every time I find a high spot, I'm just working these platforms and trying to pressure flake into them and drive a flake across to get rid of some of the high spots. So I'm not just simply crushing the edge. Like right now I'm actually kind of building a platform. And again I kind of abrade a lot less with stone with antler tools than I do with copper. But I know you can't see that too awful good. Let's look at that. You can see that there is a high spot right there. And that's what I'm working on. I just raise this edge. So now I'm going to remove flakes off of this side to see if I can't run all the way across and hit that little high turtle back. Now that little high turtle back is not going to stop us from achieving our goal of killing the animal, but I always want to refine these points as much as I possibly can. and make them as good as they can possibly be. Now, the unfortunate thing, besides my leg going numb from me sitting on it, is we didn't actually get rid of the turtle back. All we did was make a stinking step fracture right there. So again, it's not the end of the world, but I'm gonna show you a little trick where I'll take our flat piece, the one we kind of use for notching. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It may not work this time, but I'll stick it right here underneath one way or another, and see if I can break it off that way this time. I don't think it's going to work this time around. It's on there too tight, but that's a good little trick to kind of show you anyway. Sometimes you can reach under and grab a hold of that, but that's not the end of the world. That's not going to stop our point from penetrating. It's just not as perfect as I would like it to be, and if you follow anything I do, you'll know I'm a perfectionist. Okay, so we're getting very, very, very close to this being a point. You can see it's actually pretty darn thin. It's got good, uh, good uh, symmetry qualities. I'm going to work the base end just a little bit more. Not much. We're going to touch a little bit more on the base here in a minute, and it's going to make a little bit more sense to you when I do that. Because when I haft this point, it's going to make a heck of a lot more sense when you see the notch come together. So again, that little turtle back's kind of made me, made me a little angry, but I'm just going to leave it alone because maybe when we're sharpening it, we'll be able to get a hold of it. If not, not a big deal. As of right now, I think the point is pretty much where we need it to be as far as overall shape. And it's relatively thin. And I work on that tip just a little bit more. But we're pretty much ready to start notching it right now. It's pretty hard to argue with, right? So, so I mean, that's pretty darn thin. Pretty nice. Now we're going to notch it. And this one being an Edwards point, it's going to be notched more of a corner notch style like this. So it's not going to be a side notch that comes in from here. It's going to be a corner notch. So I'm going to show you how we do that. Hopefully you can get close enough here to see. And take this flat edged piece and we're going to come right on on the corner. Now you don't always want to take the smallest piece possible. We're going to kind of expand the notch a little bit at the beginning. 
not be afraid to kind of break the whole corner off like I just did right there you can kind of see it's not a bad thing so now it doesn't want to doesn't want to grab so we're going to take the big flaker again maybe just get one or two of these out of the way okay that wants to fight me even more that's fine I'll take the little guy and I'll take just a little tiny flake that doesn't want to work there either it's some there you go sometimes the problem with your stone age tools is they're just not incredibly sturdy pieces I kind of have to abandon the video and show you what I'm doing here a second because I got to get the the notch really in here and I'm not doing you any justice by trying to show you if I oh if I prop it up pretty so you can see it the reality is sometimes you have to put some real pressure behind it and that's not easily shown on camera I'm probably not going for the absolute prettiest Edwards point right here. But there's one notch, so you can see that. Now essentially what I'm doing as I work through this, I'll remove one or two flakes from one side, then I flip it over and remove one or two on the other side. I don't know if you can hear the squirrels fighting over there in the tree. They're not, but they're creating quite a racket. So now we're going to go ahead and work on this side. So we take a couple flakes and we flip it over. There's some of the process that we're working on. Okay, so take one or two flakes and then flip the point over. And as you take those first flakes away, it creates a platform that's already built up on the opposite side. And then you can flip it over. And remove even more. And again, like I said, sometimes you have to put a significant amount of power behind these and it's not really good for videoing. I'm just finding a little tiny platform and pushing on it really hard. It's actually not coming not coming off at all. It's so stiff right now. Antlers that one thing that it just doesn't grab as good as your modern copper. So anybody says that all oh, napping with antlers just as easy as napping with copper, you're not even not even close. There we go. I think I got one to let go. Try it again now with the flat one. Give me a second to work through this and it's actually it's okay the way it is but it's got me aggravated because as you can see this notch stalled out really bad so this one's kind of pretty this one's stalled out and it's ugly and now I'm aggravated with it so I would it kill fine absolutely but it's it's one of those things where I'm a perfectionist and I'm gonna have to just get after it and blow the notch out a little bit and make it a little bit better switch tools back and forth don't be afraid to do that
Almost. There we go. Finally got a good a good one to let go. Oh, there we got it. All right. So again, not always, not always the prettiest notch job that I ever do. But there, it's notch. Now, especially with one of these little Edwards points, a lot of times the base is concave. You're gonna learn why in a little bit, but right now we need to concave this, and it's important to actually do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my flaker, set it down, and I'm not gonna try to force this, but I'm just gonna gently nap the base of this concave. Now, I know that the last couple minutes of watching me try to force notches into this, probably wasn't terribly pleasant and hopefully I didn't lose you in the build but that shows you sometimes even me that a guy that does this all the time sometimes you just got to stop talking and you're just gonna have to get after it you just got to put some pressure down on it you almost got to go for broke and I mean you just get to get after it and put serious pressure and break away Okay, just about got this. There we go. So there's a fishtail on the back of this point, you see. That's kind of indicative to like an Edwards style. Usually has a concave base. I'm going to show you why in a little bit. But as of right now, it's actually a pretty good point. It's a small point. It's not the most beautiful one I've ever made, but sometimes, sometimes beauty doesn't matter, but typically it's kind of like welding. A, a, a pretty weld is oftentimes a good weld. Um, a lot of times your pretty points are also good points. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this flaker. I do have a video on my YouTube about sharpening stone points and how I make my serrations, and so I invite you to go look for that. I'll hopefully have a, dis uh, a link down in the description uh, for that as well but I'm, at this point I'm getting so many links down in this description I hope I don't forget any of them but we're gonna go along and refine this edge and I know you can't see a whole lot of what I'm doing but I'm basically taking my teeny tiny little flaker and I'm just going all oh, about every sixteenth of an oh I just snapped a tip off didn't that just piss you off. It's not a big deal. It happens all the time, but I'm getting impatient trying to get this video done for you. Talking at the camera more than I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. And I'm just going along in about every sixteenth of an inch and I'm starting to work on a serration. So, you gotta remember sometimes snapping the point off of your arrowhead is it just happens I mean even with me whether I'm talking to a camera or not sometimes you just do dumb stuff and you're not paying attention you get relaxed and it's so easy to make one mistake with your pressure and knock the tip off but that doesn't mean that you can't work a new tip on because it's no different then if this was mounted on an arrow and you shot it and you missed and say you hit a little stick or a little rock or a little root or who knows what and you snap the tip off you have to be able to come back and put a new tip on it points weren't just discarded just because you snapped the tip off you simply just napped a new point Onto it. I mean, look at that. That's all the longer it took. I, I snapped that, snap that point off. I've already got a new point started on this. Now I do need to stop running my mouth long enough to actually concentrate on what I'm doing at this point. Just hang tight with me. As I'm sharpening, again, if you ever see, if you see my video on on sharpening points, is I make a serration and then when I come back the other side, I go in the same serration and take a chip out the other way and that's what makes the little scary sharp serrations.
and that creates exceptional hemorrhage. Hopefully you follow my channel enough to know that we are repeatedly going out every single year and taking multiple animals uh, with these. So, I mean, this is what I do for a living. I make primitive hunting implements, arrowheads, bows, arrows, and then we go out and hunt with them. And we are reliably and efficiently taking animals on a very regular basis with this stuff. So it's not just theory when it comes down to making serrations and making a point sharp. It's stuff that we truly believe in. We do a lot of it. We refine our points down to these little edges. They don't hang up in the hide. I've heard people say, oh, well, serration's going to hang up in the hide. It's not going to penetrate. If you're shooting a bow that's got any, any little bit of performance, any bit of ass behind it, a pretty decent flying arrow, you're going to shoot right through an animal with one of these. But you just got to remember, the serrations aren't what slows a point down. It's the edge geometry and the tip geometry. If you've got a big rounded tip or a bunch of blunt edges, that's going to stop your penetration. Not the serrations. The serrations cut as they go through. But there are there is a difference between having serrations and sharp serrations. Just because you serrate a, part, a point doesn't mean that it's sharp. Or does you know? It's like you can have a a point that's serrated, this dull as all get out. It's just in the matter of how you sharpen that point, and that's why I did the video on sharpening the point. So hopefully you can see that. Just tiny little flakes all the way up and down, trying to get the perfect little edge. Again, not my prettiest point, not going to lie. But it is going to be a good little hunting point. Take your time along the tip. There we go. So hopefully you can see the little tip we've got on that now. The serrations are actually pretty sharp. I could probably refine them out a little bit more. Antler tools are a little tougher to get the really pretty serrations. We've got our uh, swallow tail kind of end. I end up snapping one of the little edges off. That's not one of the not one, one of the big deals either. I probably should have done those after I sharpened it, but it's not the end of the world. It's uh, kind of refine that out. That's one thing you'll notice about a lot of these Edwards points is I think that that exact same thing happens to the people that made the originals is a lot of times their little swell, swallow tails at the back are not symmetrical and I think what they oftentimes did was make a point, break it, and then rework it and then it's asymmetrical just like that one. And That's something you actually see like in an overstreet manual all the time. So anyway there's the point. That's super super pretty but it's pretty sharp. We're gonna mount it on and uh, once it's all mounted on, what we'll be able to do is come right back. We'll take a test shot with it. And then we'll come right back and we're just going to put a brand new little edge on it. Just like that. All the way up and down. And that'll make a sharp little hunting point. So thanks for following along. Um, hopefully it wasn't too awful boring sitting through an entire process of making an arrowhead start to finish. Probably about 40-45 minutes or so. So... Alright, well, catch you on the next adventure.